activities, a PhD candidate at University of Cyprus, and he will present Cypriot medieval to monuments from religious piety to their museumization and their introduction to the digital age. You can share Hello, everyone. your second. Hello. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, can you make it full? Uh, it is full. No, it's, it's not in the full screen. How can I make it? Is it now? No, you can stop sharing and reshare it maybe then it can oh work. okay okay uh, uh, uh. how about now it's uploading hmm. yes perfect thank you we can start so yes, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference uh, for the, in the initiative they have taken. Um, no. Okay. The Cypriot medieval tombstones constitute one of the most important and most consistent uh, collections of uh, uh, medieval funerary monuments in Europe. How however, I would dare to say that uh, it is uh, one of the most underestimated objects of the island's history as well. Even though uh, researchers often take them into account uh, in publications, they spent only a few lines on them. Nonetheless, the quantity in which uh, this material has been preserved reveals a lot about its significance for Cypriot history. Even if the subject of my, mat of my paper is uh, difficult to be analyzed in 15 minutes, I saw it as an opportunity to present to the general public uh, the history of these slabs because their value for Cypriot uh, culture must be appreciated. Through them, we can take a, a journey into uh, the historical and political transitions of Cyprus, uh, the religious and uh, social life during the Middle Ages, uh, the European cultural imagery, uh, phenomena of desecration and religious changes that have occurred in early modern period, and the struggles of the European powers during the 19th and the first half of the 20th century when culture became a political tool in the hands of the colonial powers in the Mediterranean. During the Middle Ages, these works were imbued with uh, religious, social, symbolic, and aesthetic qualities. Tombstones are the means of commemorating the dead. The inscriptions reflect uh, the coexistence of uh, different ethnic groups in the Luzinian kingdom. The adoption of the Western funerary custom by privileged Syrians and Greeks uh, demonstrates both uh, the uh, aspirations of a rise in social subjects and the flexibility that characterizes funerary customs. The expansion of this custom in Greek churches uh, of the Cypriot uh, countryside uh, during the 15th and 16th century reveals that it evolves from an innovation as it was at the beginning of the uh, Latin period to a given reality after a long period of uh, interrelation between the uh, different ethnic groups in the Lusignan period. Uh, this, uh, these slabs served as the main qualities with which uh, the medieval funerary monuments were invested, that is, honesty, decorum, and satisfaction. Uh, the materials from which uh, they were constructed were extracted from quarries of the island, or in case where marble was used, uh, this material probably came from ancient sites on the island. Thus, the urban space, especially that of the Latin churches, was constructed from Cypriot materials. Churches were spaces for, of power precisely through their floors. The existence of the slabs on these floors seems to, st to structure the identity of the new ruler in the island. However, over the centuries, the composition of the privileged strata of Cypriot society were redefined by new members uh, coming from other ethnic groups. In any case, it is important that uh, the construction of the concept of sovereignty through local materials 
as if this uh, power comes from the very soil of Cyprus. Moreover, the commemoration of different generations on the same slab confirms the notion of perpetual dominance. The change of ruler on the island with the transformation of Cyprus from an independent kingdom to a Venetian colony is also indicated on the slabs. An important alteration between the two sub-periods of the Latin dominance on the island is the linguistic change observed in the inscriptions with the disappearance of the French language. This is also cons consistent with the social changes in the late Lusinian period when the gradual depopulation of the Frankish aristocracy and the social upgrading of members of the Greek community is observed. For the first time, we encounter significant iconographic changes on the island, on the slab, on the slabs. In addition to the strengthening of the decoration and relief, the iconography that had been prevailing at the, in the Italian peninsula since the 14th century appears and dominates in Cyprus. This change is evidence of the influence of foreign centre on the island, bringing about significant changes in the prevailing aesthetic choices of the, of the Lusinian era. Compared to the luxury expressed by uh, Cypriot monuments uh, with relief decoration and uh, the modesty of the newly introduced Renaissance iconography in Cyprus, may be operating within a well-established context in Venice, which only belatedly appears in Cyprus. That is uh, the sanctuary laws in order to curtail excessive display. Perhaps the Venetians were attempting to influence the perceptions of the Cypriots, having such legal frameworks and, uh, and experiences from Venice, but without yet enforcing a relevant law in their colony. We can argue that the modesty and decorum in the newly arrived funerary iconography work in favor of establishing parity with the local elites, while perhaps also expressing an attempt to uh, restrain the display of these elites. In the Venetian period, the construction of the new walls was accompanied by the demolition of uh, important churches that uh, were located outside uh, the urban area defined by these walls. Uh, the Venetians undertook a symbolic appropriation and reconfiguration of the urban, social, and economic and uh, ecclesiastical landscape of the capital. Without squandering public funds, they did not invest uh, in aesthetics in, in, the, in these walls. Burial slabs from the demolished churches was used in the construction of the uh, walls. By reusing material from these churches, the Venetians put their practical spirit first so that a, a useful project could be quickly completed. There is a notable case of perhaps voluntary and symbolic use of material from these churches. Some slabs have been used as imposts at the base of the arch at the Pathos Gate. The slabs protrude from the wall with the inscriptions on their upper part and were placed in, the position, in a position where uh, the pedestrians or equestrians passing through the gate could see this intervention. Perhaps those involved in the, in the design of this gate had in mind the project uh, to stimulate the present from the, uh, the, the present through the symbolic use of the past in order to protect the future. Margaret Aston has described the mid 16th century as a time of a deliberate disrespect for the, for the dead, arguing that this was one of the causes of any regime change. In the case of Cyprus, we can make a similar, a similar argument, but for practical reasons. Defense was favored by the Venetians over the threat of the Ottomans. Thus, priority is given to the interests and the needs of the Venetian state. The way in which uh, the Venetians acted can also be explained by their attitude towards religion. First comes the state and then comes the faith. Although they did not act out of religious zeal, they distorted the numerical analogy between the burial monuments that existed in Nicosia and those we know today. Indifference, uh, neglect or, di or, or disrespect towards uh, monuments have existed since the Middle Ages and are related not only to religious, but also to practical motives. Within this framework, uh, the Ottomans reused the art that belonged to the defeated Venetians, while uh, we should also take into account the anachronism in Islam. Now we can approach uh, the changes made to the Latin church floors uh, during the Ottoman period. So here we have our reconfiguration of the church floors by changing the position uh, of the slabs turning the uh, slabs upside down, scratching the faces of the, in the effigies, uh, carpeting the floors, or using the slabs as uh, building material. Similar phenomena of destruction or reuse uh, of tombstones can be observed during periods of uh, religious or political change in Europe. The carpets in the mosques uh, were removed periodically 
allowing uh, travelers and researchers to see the study, to see and study at the slabs. An interesting testimony is provided by the antiquarian and historian Giovanni Mariti for uh, St. Sophia's slabs in Nicosia. His interest coincides with uh, the uh, research on funerary monuments and genealogy in European countries, as we can see here in France and, and Denmark. The interest on the tombstones of in Cyprus by 19th uh, century European savants can be connected to the nostalgia uh, they felt for the loss of medieval uh, burial monuments in their countries. Louis de Maslatrice's um, research in Cyprus focused in, on archaeology and topography. The French interest intensified during the Crimean War and was related to a civilizing mission which was linked to France's hegemonic claims in political and cultural matters in areas of the Ottoman Empire. Um, this interest is reflected in a 19th century manuscript and the discovery of burial slabs with French inscriptions in the Limassol area that were transferred to France in the uh, 1860s. The manuscript was compiled by, by Marcello Ceruti, who recorded some French inscriptions and a series of drawings depicting the slabs. It was the first item to uh, record and protect a heritage that was in danger of being destroyed. Maslow Tree's work uh, participated in the Anglo-French uh, competition for the appropriation of Cyprus Crusader past, which led to the British diplomatic success at the uh, Congress of Berlin. Uh, thanks to the travelers in the early British rule, uh, the question of restoration and preservation of ancient monuments was raised. A shift on issues concerning antiquities management occurred under uh, the mandate of uh, Sir Henry Bowler. In 1887, James, uh, James uh, Chamberlain started to transcribe the inscriptions on the tombstones of the Omerie Mosque and uh, other significant changes uh, churches uh, of uh, Nicosia. Uh, Maslow Tree urged uh, Chamberlain to uh, systematically record the inscriptions in the Nicosian churches, given the impossibility of relocating the slabs to a suitable place. Chamberlain published uh, Lacrime Nicosiensis, in which he transcribed the funerary inscriptions, while he also gathered information about uh, the Frankish families mentioned in the slabs. He also provided the drawings and the location of each slab within the churches. His work drew more attention, uh, more public attention uh, to the medieval remains of the island and, re and reinforced uh, the picture of Cyprus as part of the European historical space. With one exception, the British did not pursue uh, the transfer of Cypriot slabs to British museums. It was impossible to establish uh, via the inscriptions uh, any connection with the medieval English past, as the French attempted to do it uh, in uh, the mid uh, 19th century. Moreover, it was the ancient artifacts that mattered for the British Museum at that time, and not so much the local pottery, medieval and Ottoman art. Therefore, examples of medieval art uh, could be exploited, but they, could, but they would remain in situ. Chamberlain's engagement on the funerary monuments was directly linked to the lack of uh, a place for their preservation and display. He and uh, George Jeffrey started the discussion of, uh, on the musealization of uh, Cypriot tombstones in the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, and especially in the um, politically critical decades of 1920s to 1950s, Many buildings in Nicosia either hosted slabs re removed from the uh, churches or were considered suitable sites for the creation of medieval museum. The systematic removal of slabs from Nicosia's churches began only uh, in 1935 and continued in the, in the following uh, decades. So how do we evaluate uh, the uh, delay of the British in rescuing the slabs and their potential use as museum exhibits? The whole affair can be crystallized if seen within the context of power competition in the Eastern Mediterranean, when archaeology became increasingly politicized, uh, while the rivalry between uh, the great powers found an outlet in non-military ways. Already at the end of the 19th century, the French and Italians criticized the British for the mismanagement of the medieval cultural heritage in their Mediterranean col colonies. Chamberlain, Jeffrey, and an large work uh, led to international protests about uh, the failure of the British colonial government to protect Cypriot uh, medieval monuments. Over time, the interest of the friends who are observing uh, the inadequacies of the uh, British in Cyprus, but also the Italian successes on the management of uh, roads, medieval uh, monuments, 
prompted uh, the British to take more effective measures. In the late uh, 20s and 30s, through the politicization of the project of rescuing a Cypriot uh, medieval cultural heritage that was in danger, uh, the British could be able to legitimize their presence in their colony so that they could not be challenged by any potential rival in the uh, changing political circumstances of the, of the 30s. The creation of a friendlier environment for the tombstones leading to their musealization enabled the British to present themselves as rescuers of the Cypriot uh, medieval past. It is no coincidence that uh, the uh, promotion of the tombstones as artifacts took place in the 30s when the British, uh, by promoting the Western past of the island, tried to detach the Greek Cypriots from any political plan they had for the union with Greece and to promote Cyprus as a tourist destination to their subjects of their empire and abroad. The politically explosive uh, 50s uh, was marked by intensive activities by the part of the British uh, regarding the rescue of the tombstones. After the independence, uh, the Cypriots were interested in the burial slabs being engaged in the delicate task of finding for them a secure location for their permanent display. In the 20th and early 21st uh, century, a major effort to inventory all Cypriot tombstones were, was undertaken by the Department of Antiquities and the group of international researchers in order to promote and protect the medieval heritage of Cyprus. Meanwhile, other slabs were discovered. The complex history of these monuments continues to the present day if we consider uh, the cases of the tombstones of Esiv de Dampia and uh, of uh, Leo de Gardenamino. These examples brings to bring to mind uh, other burial slabs that are found inside churches until today. Although they are, uh, have been placed uh, along the walls, they can still uh, follow what is going on uh, in their old church. Uh, all in all, from works of piety and faith during the Middle Ages, the tombstones were transformed into building materials or destroyed, vandalized, uh, during the Venetian and Ottoman periods, while they, they became um, tools of political and cultural interest and ended up in museums by the British and the Republic of Cyprus. Clearly, these are not the first works of art to be transferred from churches to museums, but in their case, the viewers don't have the tools at their disposal to understand where these monuments were located in the Middle Ages or even their functions. Just as uh, there are gaps in the research on uh, Cypriot uh, funerary sculpture, there are also gaps in the museums where these slabs are displayed. My involvement in the project NETMA gave me the opportunity to work with the Cyprus Medieval Museum in Limassol, uh, for which my colleagues and I uh, are creating a digital application called DIMESI. Uh, we, have, uh, we want to offer the visitor a journey into the history of the island through the burial monuments and uh, other exhibits of the, view, of the museum. While one of our goals is uh, for the visitors to, to perceive that these uh, slabs uh, were not placed vertically on the walls, but uh, horizontally on the church floors. Thanks to this application, we will be able to provide the museum uh, visitors with the latest scientific data on its exhibits and to modernize, in general, the museum's profile. The application will be delivered to the uh, uh, Department of Antiquities towards uh, the end of uh, summer 2023. Uh, DMSI will allow the uh, visitors to walk through the museum's halls uh, following a tour in the Lusignan and Venetian Cyprus. Uh, its exhibits uh, will include tombstones, uh, armors, uh, swords, coins, uh, ceramic vessels and inscriptions uh, in the museum. Uh, its entry in the application will provide information about the people depicted uh, on the uh, slabs, while uh, through additional images, the iconography of the slabs will be linked to other similar works of art from Europe and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean area. Along with the information about the exhibits in the Limassol Castle, the visitors will be also informed about other tombstones kept, kept in museums in Paphos and Larnaca. In this way, uh, they will get a more complete idea of the Latin period of uh, Cy Cypriot history. Apart from the uh, main path that will contain all the works we decided to, to insert in the application, the visitor will be able to choose a sort of thematic paths about women or warriors in medieval Cyprus, the Greek slabs, or the transition from the uh, from the Lusignan to the Venetian period. So uh, 
In this presentation, I tried to um, outline the multi-layered history of Cypriot tombst tombstones until today. Finally, these rocks uh, are not simply rocks, as they give us information about not only the Cypriot history in the Middle Ages, but also about the more recent years of the island's history and civilization. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Savas. We will have the questions at the end of the session. So we are moving on to the second speaker, Arge Butun, MA student from Hacettepe University, exhibiting archaeological materials using new technologies, the case of the face of Yuliopolis exhibition. Hi. Hi. You can share your screen. Okay. So is it okay? Yes. Okay, so first of all, before starting, I'd like to thank to the organizing committee for having me today. Today, I will be presenting our ongoing study on, on the ancient city of Juliopolis and its exhibition made using with different technological display methods. So treasure hunting and illegal excavations endanger the preservation and survival of archeological sites, heritage sites. One way to raise awareness about cultural heritage and its destruction is to increase and increase the visibility and recognition of such sites through new technological applications in archeology span and anthropology. So our endangered site is Juliopolis. Our study focuses on, the, and then on an endangered archeological excavation site, Juliopolis. It is in Ankara, the capital of Turkey. And being located on the border of the ancient Bithynia and Galatia regions, Juliopolis was the frontier town of Bithynia and had importance due to being located at the intersection of the Silk Road and Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Road. While the city itself submerged under the dam lake built in the 1950s, the necropolis of Juliopolis is located on the hills of the northern shore of the lake. So in the video, you can see the area And the part you are seeing is the East Necropolis area. So along with the Necropolis, the remains of a church dated to 5th to 6th century AD to early Byzantine periods. And parts of a fortification wall are located on the Northern side of the reservoir as well. So this is the fortification wall. Um, the salvage excavations carried out in the Juliopolis Necropolis since 2009 by the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations have uncovered more than 750 tombs of various types. And archaeological finds unearthed from these tombs have revealed that the necropolis was used from the Hellenistic period until the Roman and Byzantine Empire periods. In addition, many graves included perfume and oil containers and citrigils, which indicated that there may have been a bath and gymnasium complex in the ancient city. So these are chamber tones. And it's a bit lagging, I guess. I'm sorry. So all of these holes are graves unearthed. So this exhibition is a part of the Juliopolis project ongoing since 2017. Actually, the project itself concentrates on the analysis of human remains from Juliopolis, holistically within the context of the ancient city. And more than 50, 50 people from different backgrounds are working on this project. And this project laid the foundation for the phases of Juliopolis exhibition. And over the time, the necropolis has been subjected to illegal activities and vandalism, which made it difficult to establish a meaningful con connection between local and local communities and the site. And in this picture, you can see the belongings of the illegal excavators in a chamber tomb. So the, 
To circumvent this problem, the Juliopolis team devised a public archaeology program in which an exhibition, The Faces of Juliopolis, was held at four different locations in Ankara and also in Izmir, with the support of the United States Embassy and Koch University Beckham, using facial traits reconstruction methods, holograms of ancient people were exhibited to help visitors to meet and empathize with the ancient people of Juliopolis. So we use different technological display methods. First of them is a fan hologram, which creates an holo holographic image using the LED lights on its lights. So when it turns, it displaces a facial reconstruction of a male individual from Juliopolis. The second one was the levitation device, which consists of a magnetic plate hovering on air on a base part and it turns in the air. Uh, we display the deformed skull from Juliopolis, Juliopolis, which is very unique because it was the first and only example of skull belonging to the Roman period in Anatolia. Our third device was basically a computer, but our team prepared a 3D model of a chamber tomb from Juliopolis using Unreal Engine. The model was interactive, which means that people could move around the tomb and see the archaeological material and findings on their own places. And our final device was kind of a hologram box. Fundam fundamentally, it is a rectangle box consisting of a silver coated glass plate in it, which is tilted 45 degrees. And there is a screen on the inside top surface of the box. The image on the screen reflects on the tilted silver coated glass and it creates an illusion of a 3D image floating on air. So we can say that it is a version of a Pepper's Ghost technique. So this is the box. Um, I'm sorry. It's a bit lagging. However, uh, aim of the exhibition was to raise cultural heritage awareness in children and to assess the effect of new technological display methods on visitors. So as a method for interviewing, we use semi-structure and depth interview methods. The semi-structure interview method was used to interview 30 visitors who were college students from Hacettepe University right after they visited the exhibition. The students were not only from the departments of archaeology and anthropology, but they were also from the departments such as communications, English and French literature and history, because we wanted to assess the reaction of students from different backgrounds. To understand the visitors' emotional states about the ex exhibition, the Turkish standards form of the positive negative emotional scale was used. In addition, we asked open-ended questions to the exhibition about the exhibition, cultural heritage, and the museum. And the depth interview method was used to interview professionals from the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations, um, Beckham, and the Munis municipality of Nallahan, and also locals from there. We asked open-ended questions to our participants to assess their opinions on the exhibition and Juliopolis, and we focused on five topics during the depth interview, which were the recognition of Juliopolis, differences between pre and after exhibition, using technology as displaying method, the facial reconstruction and empathy, and contribution of the digital archaeology. And with the locals from Nallahan, we also focused on the cultural heritage awareness in local children. So for the semi structure interview, um, the first part of the interview consisted of questions to assess visitors' emotional state after visiting the exhibition, as I said. And we saw that the positive, um, positive emotion dimensions were bigger than the negative ones. And it can be inferred that the positive emotions were felt more than the negative emotions when the two averages were compared. And the second part of the interview, we asked five open-ended questions about their exhibition about their experience of the exhibition and visiting the Museum of Anatolian Civilization. And for analyzing and for analyzing these answers, we use thematic analysis. From the analysis, we can say 
that most of the visitors found the exhibition and the museum informative, and other opinions are also positive. The facial reconstruction and the deformed skull was, uh, were the most interesting part of the exhibition. And from the exhibition, the visitors learned about the cultural diversity in Ankara and Juliapolis. And all of the visitors found facial reconstruction interesting in such ways that it helps them to embody humans from the ancient period and using the technology in the museum context. And we carried out depth interviews with um, professionals in two parts during in 2022. And we interviewed a total of 13 professionals from the Museum of Anatolian Civilization and also Koch University's Vehbi Koch Ankara Studies Research, Research Center. And as I said before, the semi-structured interviews shows us that the visitors express their positive emotions. And also they found the exhibition informative and interested, interesting. And from the results of the depth interviews with professionals, most of the professionals stated that the exhibition increased the popularity of Juliopolis. A few museum personnel mentioned that some visitors expected the exhibition would last longer and they expect more exhibitions similar to the faces of Juliopolis that is concentrating with technology. And all professionals stated that the exhibition was very interesting and that it was one of the first exhibitions using the technological display methods to, to exhibit a necropolis in Turkey. The professionals also stressed two issues. One of them is the, was about the technological devices. The technological devices used in the display were the main attractions when compared to other exhibitions that took place in the museum. The professionals observed that the visitors, especially middle and primary school students, were very interested and excited about technological devices. Some museum personnel also stated that it is necessary to use more technological ways to attract young people and the next generations. And the professionals also stated that they agreed that another interesting part of the exhibition was facial reconstruction. Many of them stated that it's a good way to establish empathy between the visitors and the skull displayed in the exhibition. However, some professionals also mentioned the ethical problems of displaying human remains in museums and displaying a digital reconstruction may be an effective solution to such problems. In addition, the professionals emphasized the observations made by the visitors. The visitors stated that when they saw the facial reconstruction of a person who lived in Juliopolis, they could establish empathy with them and embrace them. And it seems as an effective way to increase cultural heritage awareness among the local people. Um, in addition to the exhibition's contribution to the community, some professionals mentioned its scientific contribution to the field of digital archaeology. They all agreed that scientific information should be accessible and conducting such studies during the Juliopolis project can serve this purpose. Moreover, creating a digital ex exhibition, including 3D modeling of tomb chambers and the church, provides an alternative for people with special needs who may not visit the necropolis physically. And with the depth interviews with locals, in addition to the things that I that I've aforementioned, um, the point of cultural heritage awareness in local children was focused, which was the main objective of this exhibition. The interviewees expressed their opinions on how children um, were affected by the exhibition. We were told that most children didn't even know Juliopolis while they were living here, there. One of our interviewees was a teacher. And he stated that Juliopolis was just a road sign to them. And he stated that after the exhibition, the children's interest in Juliopolis increased and they activated a tourism club in their school to promote the area. The students have begun to create content about this area in social media and re receive positive reactions from other users. According to the interviewees, other local people such as parents, 
mentioned that their children started asking more questions about Juliopolis and the ancient city, which was submerged under the dam lake. Parents also stated that they want more public archaeology events like this exhibition so that their children can benefit from them. As for future directions, they demand a small museum in Chayirhan Mallahan so that the materials found in Juliopolis can be more accessible for the locals and a tour guide to explain the importance of the ancient city to locals and the tourists. For the conclusion, overall, both visitors and professionals found the exhibition innovative and attractive, while museum professionals were inspired to incorporate these types of technology in their own museum management practice. Visitors indicated that they were able to empathize with the Juliopolis people whose first faces were reconstructed. Our findings suggest that such technological applications can attract visitors to museums where traditional methods of display may not be as appealing. And also in part, our, we believe that our exhibition reached the goal of the raising cultural heritage awareness and also attract the attention of um, professionals as well to reconstruct and conservation of the area. However, it is just a beginning, but we, we managed to get attention of the public and now the public require more from the concerned administratives. Finally, I would like to thank to our shareholders in this exhibition, the United States Embassy and WECAM, and also to our participants to the interviews. And of course, I'd like to thank you for your attention and patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arge. Uh, we'll move on to the third speaker, Katena Ari Raki, MA student at National Kabbalist Stream University of Athens. And her topic is the perception of prehistoric antiquity in the 19th century Greece. Hello. Hi, you can share your screen. Yes. Hmm. Can you see it? Not yet. Can you make it full screen? Okay. Yes, thank you. Great. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. My talk will be a bit more theoretical. Uh, so, as you have probably guessed by the title, I will discuss the perception of historic antiquity in 19th century Greece. Uh, this study is based on works written by antiquarians and excavators of the 19th century, out of which the largest part is the publications of the Archaeological Society at Athens. Uh, so, very briefly, I will first set the general scene of the 19th century as a whole, as far as both Greece and the rest of the Western world are concerned. I will then mention some of the most important excavations of prehistoric sites and how their results define the mindset of the excavators. And finally, I will make a holistic assessment of these facts and their impact on prehistoric archaeology and, of course, its perception. Uh, so starting from the Renaissance and up to the 18th century, the study of antiquity was basically comprised by the study of ancient Greek and Latin literature. Uh, the visits at whatever monument was still standing, and of course the, the salvaging, meaning the illegal collection of antiquities by aristocrats and antiquarians. Uh, needless to say that only the classical past was of any interest to them, especially monuments such as the Parthenon or the Temple of Apollo in Arcadia. Uh, of great interest was of course anything that was mentioned in the literary sources, an example by Pasania Soro by Strabo, uh, and hence places like Mycenae could be part of an antiquarian's journey. <clears throat> All of the aforementioned tactics were only enhanced uh, during the 19th century. Uh, now there are also some other facts that need to be taken under consideration when discussing the perception of anything by people. Um, that is the general ideological and social setting of the time. Uh, as is well known, the 19th century was a period of fundamental changes and the foundation of ideologies and movements. 
scholars are obviously not left untouched by these changes. Uh, so we have romanticism, one of the top reasons anyone would bother visiting Greece. Visitors would be touched by their rural landscapes and their abandoned ruins. And let us not forget that during this period, heated by revolutionary movements, Greece was also fighting for independence. Uh, in the same spirit, right after the Greek Revolution and with the young states starting to form in the 1830s, nationalism drove Greek scholars and archaeologists into using the science in favor of the nation's benefits. In other words, they were striving to establish a national identity and narrative based on the classical past as its symbol, justifying why the country deserves a place among the great powers of the West. Everything that preceded or succeeded this golden classical period was of no importance for the newly founded Greek nation, unless they proved to be historical extensions of classical antiquity and therefore parts of cultural continuation in this nationalistic narrative. So what was the place of the historic antiquity in all of this? Uh, for years and years, even during the recent 20th century, being a prehistoric archaeologist meant careful studying of literary sources, locating mentions of ancient cities or buildings, and then venturing out to look for their actual existence and location, places that would validate the historicity of ancient myths and stories. Uh, one of the greatest such examples, and one that emphasizes also the great geographical and theoretical scope of this practice, uh, is the search for Homer's Phoenicians, starting from the 18th century onwards. Even more so after the decoding of the Phoenician alphabet and its acceptance as a fundamental element in European identity, Western travelers would increasingly roam the Mediterranean coast, seeking for the land of the Phoenicians. Uh, let us not forget as well that social background was of little to no concern for scholars and the typologies and chronologies that had been established were all based on classical finds and aesthetics by Winkelmann and so forth. Anything that did not fall into these certain categories would be of no interest to anyone. Uh, this is how Greek prehistoric um, finds ended up being classified as primitive products, qualitatively inferior to the classical ones, and products of a non-Greek foreign people. Uh, to put it plainly, prehistoric archaeology was simply the identification of ruins with sites and cities mentioned mainly in Homer's epics or in other mythological narrations. Uh, this was the only way prehistory could serve the greatest purpose of reinforcing the national identity, improving the cultural connection and continuation of modern and classical Greece to a heroic even older past. Well, now to the excavations themselves. <clears throat> uh, the year 1876 is marked by the breakthrough excavations of Schliemann in Mycenae. Uh, up till that point, the scarce finds uh, of what is today modern Greece were dismissed by the academic community as products of an Oriental people, and their only contribution to the field was their recognition as ancient, ancient remains, uh, to an even, indicating to an even older than previously thought activity in the area. Um, and to say the truth, even the finds in Mycenae were not hardly embraced by the community at first. However, the city's mention in Homer's epics gave a sense of greatness to the Mycenaean remains, a greatness sought out by both Greece and Europe. Uh, and so Schliemann's ultimate contribution was the validation through excavation of the historicity of uh, Homer's protagonists. And this in return also legitimized the practice of using philological texts as archaeological facts up to almost today. Following the excavation of Mycenae were several discoveries of prehistoric sites that helped in boosting the interest of scholars in prehistoric remains, uh, mainly because they fell under the broader category of Mycenaean civilization. Uh, in other words, they had not been made by the ancient Greeks, but they were at least products of these Homeric people, the Mycenaeans, which appear to have expanded geographically in a larger than first expected area. And on this note, also let me point out the discovery that had the greatest impact on the development of Greek prehistoric archaeology, uh, the unveiling of what we call today cycladic civilization. Uh, the first but slow start was made in 1885 with the looting of cemeteries in Amorgos and Babiparos. Uh, and the finds pointed to a dating even older than that of the Mycenaean civilization. But however old, they, they remain lowly products of an oriental people. Uh, a disdainful attitude towards cycladic archaeology had started even before these illegal excavations by the ancient Greek literature, 
an example to give you is uh, mentioned because of Korea, Phoenicia, and the rest always under a negative light. Here he calls them, for example, pirates. Uh, so even though the mere mention of the Cycladic remains by ancient Greek historians and playwriters added a hint of Greekness to them, they had been stigmatized by those very same sources, and so terms like Carian or Phoenician were used to describe something primitive and non-Greek by scholars, I mean. Uh, in any case, the respective artifacts were found stratigraphically in levels seemingly predating the Mycenaean ones, and they validated the Kikivides mentions of Oriental people living in uh, the Greek area. Uh, and so scholars were convinced of the kinship of the prehistoric primitive peoples residing in Greece with the Orient. This theory is also reflected in the preliminary dating system of the historic Aegean, uh, starting from the most ancient Amorian period or period of uh, the systems, moving on to the Therian period or the pre Mycenaean one, and finally the Mycenaean period. Uh, several scholars insisted that a cultural gap had taken place in between the first two phases. And it was during this gap that uh, the Oriental people had migrated to the Aegean area. And at this point, I will also mention that Schliemann had also suggested a theory that aligned with this very argument. In 1886, he suggested that the population of theorems could be categorized into groups. The first and oldest one was responsible for the handmade and less pretty pottery that he discovered in the Acropolis, while the second and later one uh, crafted the wheel-made fine vessels. This differentiation in pottery production was explained in terms of ethnicity, uh, the most primitive one was created by a local people or nation uh, who were later conquered by a technologically superior one that arrived from the east. Around the same period, the so-called gap and oriental invasion had occurred in the rest of the Aegean. And so it is implied that both local, meaning Greek and oriental people uh, and elements coexisted during the Greek prehistory. Uh, the deconstruction of this invasion theory slowly started with excavations in Milos by the British school at Athens at the end of the century. The stratigraphy of Philacopi clearly showed a continuation from the primitive <clears throat> Amorian period till the pre-Mycenaean one. Uh, if there indeed had taken place a chronological gap followed by an invasion, uh, then it would, it would have been impossible for the most important port and settlement of the central Aegean, as Philacopi was seen by the excavators. Uh, to have been completely unaffected by this. Uh, the excavations at Milos set the strongest foundations for the arguments in favor of the cultural unity and continuation of the Aegean civilization, a civilization that apparently had both Anatolian and Mycenaean traits. Also, they worked in favor for a more kind view of the actual oriental artifacts. Uh, at the end of the century, Christos Judas also argued in favor of this with much more solid and, let's say, scientific arguments. And he recognized the Greekness of the Cycladic civilization and chronologically defined it as having in ancient or earlier and later periods. <clears throat> uh, the study conducted on the Cyclades and Mycenae, but mainly on the islands, had a great impact on the study of prehistoric Aegean in total, serving as the impetus for the growth of the field. So thus, using the Cycladic artifacts as the focus of his work, managed to prove the prevailing Orientalist theories and basically demonstrated that the Mycenaeans and the peoples before them were in fact Greeks. Uh, what makes him stand out from the rest of the scholars of his time is the fact that he employed a more scientific approach contrary to the more philological ones, uh, the ones that were the commonest way of studying the historical genome. Uh, he used excavational data and proceeded in what we may call today comparative and ethnographic archaeology. One of the greatest such examples is his attempt to prove the origins of the oldest Greek races, as he called them, from the north by comparing and demonstrating the evolution and spread of the circular buildings from Northern Europe all the way down to the Peloponnese. Uh, but I won't go into details because they are kind of relevant to this presentation, but what is important for this is to not remember that Sundas basically attempted to distance Greece from the east and bring it closer to the west and obviously to reinforce the Greek narrative and identity. 
Uh, this ethnocentric view of Greek historical archaeology was in reality contributing to a process that was much grander and much older than the construction of Greek national identity. And that is European geopolitical expansion and the appropriation of the East by the West. To emphasize this point, I am simply mentioning general feats, let's say, that took place in the 19th century. Uh, we have two very important constructions, like that of the Suez Canal or the Orient Express railway line that brought East and West closer to each other on a very practical level. We have the wish to expand trade routes in general. There's even an Orientalist movement in art. These are all manifestations of the general need of the West to approach and dominate over the East, starting, of course, from the Middle Ages and the quest for their holy lands. As West religious symbols and alphabetical birthplace were found in the Orient, the former's claims of what was rightfully theirs was constant and sometimes violent until it slowly took the form of antiquarianism and scientific interest. Uh, taking all of this into account, we understand how Greek historic archaeology, no matter how underdeveloped it was in the field, was instrumentalized for the purpose of appropriating the East. It was Napoleon himself, himself after all, that during his expeditions in Egypt, said that no land can ever be conquered without knowing and understanding fully its history and culture. And so at first, literary sources were employed. On one hand, there is Homer who speaks of the Phoenicians as people of as a people of merchants and seafarers, the creators of language, of course. On the other hand, there's Herodotus and his concurrent writers uh, who spoke of the oriental origins of the Greek gods and heroes. Both of these are mentions that break the gap. With these tools at hand, the scholars of the 19th century could proceed into looking for the material evidence of this, of the affinity of East and West. Prehistoric archaeology uh, of Greece unknowingly played a part in the Orient's westernization. Europe, who was going through an Oriental period and who saw in itself an emerging spiritual and geographical empire equal to the Athenian one of the 5th century BC, discovered an equal Oriental period that preceded the great classical Greece, a period during which local people were mingled with Easterners in Greek grounds, just as Schliemann said had happened in Tyrians. From this mingling rose an art, the prehistoric one, of course, uh, that was primitive and unfinished, as they called it, nothing like the classical one. Uh, its progress, however, led to the perfection of the latter. In the same sense, the West relates itself spiritually, culturally, and evolutionarily with both mankind's most perfect historic era and also the one preceding it. Moreover, this connection provides an excuse for the Westerners to appropriate the East, since right from the start, they are one and the same anyway, uh, the place where literate civilization originated from. Um, you've heard me mention definitions quite a few times already, because as I said, they were a key part of this process of appropriation. Perhaps they're not exactly part of prehistoric archaeology in the modern sense, but back then they belonged to the wider Homeric archaeology, or as you want to say, 19th century, century's view of historic archaeology. So the intense quest of the Phoenicians on Greek land was one of the strongest arguments in this westernization of also Greece. They were mentioned by several ancient Greek scholars and they were thought to be seafarers, what better candidates to play the part of the invaders from the east in the Aegean than not by these Homeric people. This attempt or need, if you like, to explain the origins of European literacy from the east helped at the same time slowly dissolve Europe's skepticism over the barbaric East. Uh, ancient Oriental peoples, Greece included, were westernized. Therefore, even if it was difficult to argue in favor of the Greeks of the Mycenaeans, they were still part of Europe's ancestral prehistoric civilization. And all of this would have been difficultly achieved if it weren't for the emergence of Greek prehistoric antiquity as an important archaeological field in a nation's nationalistic narrative. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Katerina. Uh, we will continue with our last speaker, Andrea Siogelis, a PhD candidate in the University of Glasgow. And the title is Legal Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage, a class from the Republic of Cyprus.
Um, hello everyone, um, I'm here today to speak about the legal protection of um, underwater cultural heritage uh, and offering the Cypriot perspective. Uh, before commencing, I would like to thank the organizers of this um, great event. And I will begin uh, with any further uh, ado. Um, after this very short introduction, uh, I will briefly touch the historical development of the Cypriot maritime archaeology. I will then take a dive into the legal protection of underwater cultural heritage, both at an international but also national level, emphasizing uh, the relevant case law by Cypriot courts and the several cooperation agreements. Some concluding remarks follow, summarizing the key findings uh, of the paper of the presentation. Uh, the baby steps of uh, exploring the maritime surrounding of the island go back in the late 30s, when the first initiatives have been undertaken. Uh, those initiatives were mainly restricted to the shores of the island, such as harbors. The year 1967 is a 10 year for the development of Cypriot maritime archaeology, is the date of uh, the discovery of Kirinia ship. One of the best uh, examples uh, of um, Greek wooden ships found in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. This has promulgated um, the development of public awareness and interest for maritime archaeology in the island. Uh, the years to come, the Cyprus became a center of maritime archaeology. Probably the second most important uh, discovery is. Uh, the Mazatozrek, uh, south of Larnaca, discovered in 2006, uh, which concerned uh, a wreck um, transferring wine from probably um, mainland Greece. Uh, several other examples could be cited. Just to give an example is the excavations taking place at the Nishapora um, area. With this in mind, um, a question which arises is what is the legal protection of uh, the Cypriot um, underwater cultural heritage? Uh, I'm first commencing from the international level and then moving gradually to the national level. Uh, the first uh, relevant uh, instrument is uh, the United Nations Convention for the Law of the Sea or the Constitution of the Oceans, comprising from um, 320 articles with um, only two articles referring to underwater cultural heritage. Article 303 uh, sets the general duty of protection of underwater cultural heritage in all maritime zones. More problematically, uh, upon the insistence of uh, the US, uh, paragraph three of uh, this provision invites the application of law of salvage and the law of fines, uh, by which I mean commercial hunters searching for antiquities in maritime zones. And paragraph four, urges states to cooperate for the protection of underwater cultural heritage. Uh, Article 149 is inapplicable in the case of uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea because it deals with um, issues beyond the national jurisdiction of um, the area. Um, the shortcomings of the uh, UNCLOS uh, mainly the invitation of looting of cultural objects uh, led the international community to adopt a specific document on the protection of underwater cultural heritage, the 2001 UNESCO Convention. Until today, it counts 72 states. Cyprus is not a state party to the convention. Um, at a very basic uh, level, the main features of uh, the convention is uh, the definition for the first time 
um, of underwater cultural heritage, favoring um, in situ protection of underwater cultural heritage, prohibiting the commercialization of underwater cultural heritage, and urging states to cooperate for the protection uh, of underwater cultural heritage. I will return on this point later. Uh, moving from the international to the domestic um, level, the starting point uh, is the Cypriot Constitution, whose um, Article 23, Paragraph 1, vests um, ownership of antiquities to the state. Uh, the most important legislative document in Cyprus regulating antiquities is the Antiquities Law, Chapter 31, which um, applies both to land but also maritime antiquities, mainly after the amendments of 2014. Uh, again, the Antiquities Law provides uh, a broad definition um, of antiquity. It vests um, ownership of antiquities to the state, both land but also maritime. Following the um, 2014 amendments, we have now a special part for underwater cultural heritage in the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf, meaning until um, 200 nautical miles. Uh, we have a general duty of protection of underwater cultural heritage, the possibility of creating um, an underwater cultural heritage protector protection zone. This has already defined application in the case of Mazodozrek. And again, uh, uh, the non-commercialization of antiquities and uh, the punishing with severe penalties of imprisonment and the fine. Two years later, uh, uh, we have um, the adoption of um, uh, a specific document, particularly referring to underwater cultural heritage. It comprises from 26 articles and essentially incorporates the annex of the UNESCO Convention. Uh, so we have, again, same provisions about the non-commercialization of underwater cultural heritage and in-situ protection. The combination of um, those regulations with the amendments of 2014 actually led to the conclusion that Cyprus, even though not a state party to the UNESCO Convention, applies its spirit, it, the spirit of the Convention. Other legislative instruments could be cited, um, just to give an example, the Hydrogapton's law, in the light of um, energy resources exploration. Cypriot courts had uh, the opportunity to deal with um, uh, the protection of underwater cultural heritage in two instances. Uh, the case coming um, uh, from the Supreme Court of Cyprus concerned uh, the vessel with the name Odyssey Explorer, part of the US company Odyssey Marine Exploration with the flag of Bahamas. The um, vessel uh, moved suspiciously in December of 2015 between the Lebanese and the Cypriot exclusive economic zone. Uh, on 23rd of December of 2015, a judge issued a search warrant in order to confirm whether antiquities have been exported from the um, Cypriot exclusive economic zone and stored to the ship. The company objected to, to this um, uh, measure. Uh, it even suggested that even if antiquities are found on the vessel, the authorities cannot confirm whether they are originate from Cyprus or from another state. Uh, the court rejected all the arguments made by the company, both for procedural but also substantive reasons. It suggested that the claim has been filed with a substantive delay, but also the mere suspicion was enough for the authorities to check whether those antiquities were indeed on the vessel or not. An appeal followed again before the Supreme Court the, the next year. Uh, again, all the arguments have been rejected by the Supreme Court of Cyprus. The investigation finally brought into daylight 20, uh, 55 um, containers with around 580 objects, despite um, the allegations of uh, the company. Uh, the investigation showed that the objects have been extracted from the Lebanese exclusive economic zone. Uh, Lebanon at the time was party to the 2001 UNESCO Convention, but Cyprus not. 
but they had both an obligation to protect and cooperate for the underwater cultural heritage under UNCLOS. Further legal proceedings are still pending today before the District Court of Limassol over the legality of the seizure and the ultimate fate of the objects. So it remains to be seen uh, the outcome of the case. In the light of this um, development, Cyprus has been particularly active in promoting the cooperation um, for the protection of underwater cultural heritage. This is also codified by paragraph four of UNCLOS and article six of the 2001 UNESCO Convention. Cyprus um, until today signed several bilateral or trilateral agreements with Cyprus, Greece, sorry, uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Israel, Lebanon and Israel. Just to give an example is the Nicosia Declaration between Egypt, Greece and Cyprus, which underlines the need to protect underwater cultural heritage and laid down the possibility of um, establishing a special agreement between the three states about the protection of underwater cultural heritage. To sum up, uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, underwater cultural heritage is a time capsule. Once is lost, is lost forever. Cyprus hopefully uh, realized this and took concrete steps to afford protection to underwater cultural heritage with the 2014 amendments and the 2016 regulations. Um, Cyprus in this way moves closer to the international standards. Uh, and it also illustrates how the UNESCO convention slowly yet steadily influences domestic legislation. An equivalent example is the case of Australia, which adopted the legislation without ratifying the convention. Yet certain challenges and problems remain in the case of Cyprus. There are some contradictions between the UNESCO convention and the separate legislation about the ownership of antiquities, especially in zones like the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. To my best uh, knowledge, there are no current plans uh, from Cyprus to ratify the convention, yet those developments uh, form a sound basis for the future ratification of the convention. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for all the, thank you to all the speakers of the last session. So for the final Q&A session, we can start from our first presenter, Salvas Mamamotidis, if you have any questions for him from online. I, we, we don't have a question in chat if you, yes, this is coming. Hi, Samas. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I just wanted to ask, uh, you said in your presentation that you have both uh, gypsum and limestone marble slabs, if I'm correct. Do you, think, do you see any like social status difference between the two because marble is, should, must have been imported? So it must be an important uh, tombstone or slab. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, mar uh, the slabs with marble in uh, the Cypriot uh, environment, uh, concerning these slabs, I think that the uh, uh, marble uh, come uh, not uh, from an exterior source outside of uh, Cyprus, from the, abor from the abroad, but uh, it's uh, a reuse of uh, rocks uh, that already uh, were in Cyprus, in ancient sites of Cyprus. Uh, we have um, uh, the most, uh, the majority, if I can say that, uh, of uh, the slabs uh, on, uh, with the marble. We have them in Famagusta and in Paphos. And so we can understand that there uh, are uh, ancient sites uh, near these uh, cities. I think that it is a reuse of ancient uh, stones. 
Okay, thanks, Salas. Any other questions? I have one more, uh, again, about the social studies, actually. Uh, Newton mentioned about uh, material, uh, but because I remember many other examples from other regions, not specifically Cyprus and maybe because it's a bit far from me, but when it comes to the social studies, you mentioned a bit about allied in question mark, but do you have any iconography about when uh, like gender specified or uh, social studies specified in terms of their maybe jobs or their hierarchical uh, circumstances in the society and the funerary slabs or uh, gray marks? Yeah. Uh, well, the status uh, is provided mainly from the fact that these people uh, had the means to uh, uh, buy or commission uh, such an artwork. For their uh, in the context of their funerary custom. Uh, secondly, we can see uh, their uh, social status, uh, for example, in the slabs uh, with uh, effigies of warriors uh, by their uh, atir uh, with armor. Um, or if we uh, go uh, to the Venetian times, uh, we can see their status uh, ma uh, mainly. Uh, from uh, uh, the inscriptions, which uh, uh, laudatory inscriptions of uh, their status, their life, uh, or something like that. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, we have one more question. Yes, one more quick question. Uh, do we see significant differences in the iconography employed by Frankis and Greek? Uh, people in, uh, in the creation of uh, these slabs? Uh, not so much. I would say that uh, a change in the iconography between uh, Frank's, uh, Frank's and uh, Greek uh, slabs comes uh, with uh, during the Venetian period, mainly there uh, at this uh, period. Uh, because it's uh, the Greek and uh, the Syrian uh, people uh, who mainly used uh, the engraved effigies uh, and not the incised effigies uh, for their tombstones. Uh, and we can see that uh, in the statistics uh, I made uh, uh, for the Venetian period uh, that uh, it's mainly the Greeks uh, who use the engraved iconography uh in the um, venetian period and uh it's the venetians who introduces the new iconography uh comes from uh, italian the italian peninsula and then the greeks are uh trying to imitate uh the venetians by using this new iconography but uh no there is no other iconographical difference uh, between the frankis and uh, uh the greek uh slabs Okay, thank you. Except, of course, uh, the, if, it, if we consider the dress. Thank you so much, Salva. So uh, we can continue with our second speaker, Argy Buchan, for the questions. Argy, are you here? Okay, great. Hi. So I can start with my questions if you will not. Okay. So it's it's a question more of my personal interest, actually, because I'm doing also. Uh, I'm working with some contemporary art museums in Turkey for uh, people in special needs. So you mentioned briefly about the 3D modeling and how you engage with this people in special needs, but it's, is it the only application for now that you're doing for them or uh, will it be new applications for every special needs and also for general exhibition? Well, right now it is the only example but of course we would like to enhance our applications, but it's now in progress actually. Okay, and another question about uh, locals that you're interacting in the Nalahan area. Yeah. Uh, so because we experienced some, uh, after public archaeology is more supported recently in Turkey. <laughs> so there are uh, a few examples, especially in, in Bolsak project, for example, and some others in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean of Turkey, that after they contacted more with the locals, they, for example, in the winter season when there's no excavation around, they started to call people when there is an illegal uh, 
issue in the area. They have regular contacts with the team of the project, so they can access whenever they want when they realize something is wrong in the field. Is there any development like this for the for your? Uh, yeah. Yes, actually, one of the officials from the municipality of Nallahan mentioned that after the ex ex exhibitions, the local peoples were more open to make calls about the illegal ex illegal activities on the site. So they are calling the police and the gendarmerie more often. So yeah, it's, it's something. I mean, for the ones who are not familiar with Turkey and these illegal issues, it's really yeah. hard to convince local people to help about it because they are also afraid of being accused by the authority so it's it's a good yeah. <laughs> uh, step for us yeah. are there any other questions for Arge? okay thank you so much Arge. thank I, you so much i have more questions but because we have kind of time limitation i will email you yeah <laughs> thank you so thank much you. so Questions for our third speakers, Katina Arnidaki. We don't have, I should check. No, okay, oh, sorry. Okay, questions, yes. Hello, Katarina, one quick question. Uh, how do you see Minoan archeology span fitting in this history of Greek self-identification -ident through archeology? span how did that play into it? So minor archaeology didn't really play that great of a part because it really had a slow start. And since Crete was under Ottoman occupation, the, the Greek scholars could not really participate that well. Uh, they could not really, really have uh, as much of an impact as they wanted to like really on, on the Peloponnese or on the island. Uh, there was, of course, uh, Schliemann and then Evans who really tried to make something happen on, uh, in Knossos, and that happened much later to the, the end of the century. So uh, I can't really, it, it, they really were not, Crip was really not part of this narrative, this, the, the construction of the narrative. But uh, whatever was uh, occurring, whatever uh, find seemed primitive, uh, was also categorized as Mycenaean. They thought that Mycenaeans were also on Crete, if there were prehistoric peoples. That's why I did not really talk about it now. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Any other questions for Katerina? Okay. Thank you, Katerina. So I will uh, continue with Andreas. Maybe you can come here. Any questions? Yes. Yes, I'd uh, like to first like a comment. Thank you very much for the presentation because I think it's really important to be discussed about in our forums because when we talk about uh, our international community, we usually talk about high schools. With their schools, with the broken organs, but work in Europe can be a domestic base, so it's very important for us as a society to step up for these beautiful arts. So I have two very good questions. The first, just out of curiosity, uh, okay, here uh, Cyprus is a close to Turkey, so we do have okay, but if we have a more maritime space uh, and to define our growth. Nice question. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, on the first part of the question, I think um, it's nice to have a legal perspective, though I'm not so objective uh, as a lawyer, uh, because you need um, the practical measures taken in order to punish uh, potential um, infringements of the law. Uh, so we need to respect, but also applying practice law. Uh, on the second question, um, actually, this is um, the provision 149 of um, UNCLOS, which I haven't, I, I just referred to, to this provision because it's inapplicable in the case of the Eastern Mediterranean because of um, the, the nautical miles. But uh, let's say in the Atlantic, 
in such cases, uh, both UNCLOS and the UNESCO Convention um, does not uh, refer to ownership uh, in such spaces. To give an example, is the Titanic Agreement found uh, in uh, zones which belong to um, no, no state. So there has been an agreement between France, Canada, US, and UK about the preservation of Titanic. Thanks again. Uh, actually, um, there are certain provisions, both to the basically to the UNESCO Convention, uh, saying that the state can create um, a heritage zone where diving is prohibited, that no activities of fishing is allowed, uh, but also, uh, for instance, I refer to the hydrocarbons law. Um, when granting licenses to companies to for energy um, exploration, there is a provision to their contracts that in case that there is um, a discovery of under, underwater cultural heritage, we need to respect the relevant legislation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can you elaborate a bit more why Cyprus is not ratified? Uh, many thanks uh, for the question. Um, uh, I guess this is, um, I have spoken uh, with uh, the Department of Antiquities. I guess uh, the reason for the non ratification of the convention might be two reasons, I think, in my opinion. Firstly, issues with sovereignty in the sense that uh, the UNESCO Convention speaks about um, a complex system of notification and cooperation about underwater cultural heritage in the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf, whereas the Cypriot legislation speaks about ownership. So there's a divergence between the Cypriot legislation and the UNESCO Convention. I guess the second reason uh, is the issue of um, contested waters, which um, um, drives away from the issue of underwater cultural heritage and it has to do with issues of maritime delimitation between states in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. But this is just my hypothesis. Hope I have answered. Thank you, Andres. So we the last of the last <laughs> session. We want to highlight and thank you. So I have a small list to not forget, I will read it. And we would like to highlight a few more things. Where's our map? I downloaded it. It's here. We're trying to find our map, but okay. So, uh, for the beginning, thank you very much to all. Uh, we're so happy and grateful for all, all contributions, but we have a list for more details. So, it's the first form of the Mediterranean archaeology, graduate form of Mediterranean archaeology in. Uh, archaeological research unit and we are hoping to have this event as a biennial we don't know if it will continue as hybrid or not we will see in the future and uh, but uh, before we close we had 50 presenters including posters from 26 institutions from different countries and in a 
topic expanded from prehistory to Ottoman periods with a variety of theoretical and methodological approaches. So for a first graduate for we're so happy for this results. And we're and we would like to starting to thank you to our list. First, um, I want to, including myself, I want to thank you to the committee and uh, who are somebody else. Okay, the committee, yes. <laughs> the committee, Nisan Kökner, Teodoro Vasilium, Mirto Kalofono, Agapitu, I'm still practicing Greek pronunciation. Samina Hazri Pantene, Ponos Diamantopoulos. And we would like to thank you all the chairs for this two days for supporting us and to the Department of History and Archaeology and Professor Parani and uh, Professor Demestico for supporting us and being here. And to our keynote speaker, Bernard Nair, for his speech uh, on the first day and Archaeological Research Unit and Professor Vionis. And of course, for helping us in every step of managing this forum and technical stuff, uh, Konstantinos Trust Cities and her secretary. <laughs> To Alona for catering and our volunteers uh, from uh, MA students, Jules Juan, Nicolette and Nin, and to all the audience for being here and online. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Mm-hmm.